back to another episode here of the Gold Coast Titans Frontline Podcast. We are pumping along now. I know the NRL men's season is done and dusted, but we're going to be chatting about that here today as well. We've got the women's games going on still. We had a great win against the Bramata Squeals, the Parramatta Eels. Had a great win there, so we'll be previewing that today. Plus, we've also got the Burley Bears action still cracking on. Unfortunately, we don't have the Tweedhead Seagulls in the Host Plus Cup at the moment, but the Burley Bears, they're into the grand final, baby. It's going to be a great chat there today. But if you guys don't know, the Gold Coast Titans Frontline Podcast. We talk everything Gold Coast Titans. In and out, in and out, shake it all about. My name's Blaze from Big House Sport, and I'm here with Dane from Clarkie's Rugby League column. How are we doing, man? Mate, really good. It's a great time of the NRL season. Um, in the NRLW, there is premiership muscle being flexed out of control there. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger likes flexing going on there. It's it's lovely to watch. Um, and then, of course, reserve grade, where we're featuring some of our younger Titans, well, they could be going through to a grand final, which of course would give them experience on the big stage, which can only be better for our men's future. So bloody great time of the year, great stuff happening around our club still, despite our men missing the finals. And I've got to ask, actually, do you have a team that you are favoring or going for at this stage in the NRL season? I know Sharks, uh, your family side, they went down by one point. Is there another team you'd like to see going from here? Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that one, man. Yeah, that was a really (laughs) fun one to watch this weekend as I knew that, uh, you know, my mum's team is the Sharkies, right? So I do get behind the Sharkies for my mum. I I would love to see them going well. Uh, So not only do I have to suffer the pain of the Gold Coast Titans men's team this year, but I got to witness an absolute heartbreak there for the Sharkies. I would say that in regards to, you know, if I was to get behind another team here, it would be, you know, the likes of the Warriors or the Knights, which do have their positives and negatives for us in regards to banter terms. I think that Knights, for me, they're a real, you know, they're one of those teams where it's very easy to get behind them because they are a battler like us, and so are the Warriors. They're a battler like us. However, the Warriors haven't won a premiership before, and neither have we. So if they were to go and win it, now we've got another team that we have to compete with in regards to the banter of, oh, guess what? We've won a premiership and you haven't. At the moment, we've kind of got them alongside. So although I am supporting the Warriors to do well this year, the Knights are, are kind of a team that I would love to, to to crack on. But again, I actually think that the Warriors are going to get the win over the Knights this week. So I think that, look, when it comes to me, I just want to see a fresh competition. I don't want to see the same teams winning over and over again. I think everyone's like that. You know, We've seen enough of the Storm winning. We've seen enough of the Roosters winning. I guess we've also seen enough of the Panthers winning, but you do also have to just appreciate the success that they've built for their team and hope that one day we can emulate that. So for now, it's between the Warriors and Knights, but with that being said, yeah, the two teams that I have an affiliation with, obviously the Titans, which is is my team, and then Mum's team, which is the Sharkies. But then again, when the Titans play the Sharks, I want to absolutely whoop them. It's just that we're not when we're not playing them. But uh, yeah, the two teams that I actually kind of cared about, they're Gonski, son. They're Gonski. And when the Titans do play the Sharks, there is often a drunk person in the crowd next to you <laughs> yelling uh, obscenities to the Sharks fans. Then myself, I'm really yeah. joking. Um, but you know, you're I'm not though. The same it, well, well, you, well, you, no, you're well, not because it did happen down in Ericanola. It did. Look, is it on camera? Oh wait, it is. <laughs> it's on YouTube in 4K. Um, but I, I used to be the same where my family team's the Eels, so I would cheer them, um, except for so every sorry. other team, over every other team, but the Titans got to the point where I just couldn't handle the heartbreak two like two times every weekend. So I've really disconnected from the Eels respectfully in recent years. I think I'd like to see, oh, look, I really want to see the Warriors go on. But as you said, I'd hate to be the only club without an NRL premiership. Um, Dolphin, 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 oh, Dolphin, Dolphin, of course, Dolphin, Dolphin, of course. Yes, of course. My, my apologies. Who could forget those uh, scrubs that fluked uh, finishing above us on the ladder, of course. No, but in all seriousness, uh, my daughter's godfather goes for the Knights and seeing him, you know, really happy about the win last week, seeing his side back in finals, I think I'm going to get around them. Uh, but yeah, NRL's still exciting, even though our team's not there. Let's jump into our Titans news segment. I, I want to start off the segment by talking the equation for our NRLW side this week. So a win against the Raiders means we absolutely maintain third position, but we could go higher. Ideally, we want a few results to go our way so that we can get a home final. If we lose, it needs to be by less than 11. However, if the Broncos, uh, if the Broncos are beaten by the Dragons, then it's okay that we lost that. That's fine there. We just can't lose by more than 11 and have the Broncos win. We want the Roosters to lose to the Cowboys. If the Roosters lose to the Cowboys, we get a home final. So for everyone this week, our NRLW sides we want to be cheering on are the Cowboys and Dragons, and of course, our Titans. 
Um, I, I want to ask you, so the official crowd attendance on the NRL website is listed as 2,086 at our last NRLW game against the Eels. How high do you think that figure can rise come finals? I think that the the attendance was... Look, on the Eastern Grandstand in the sun, obviously, it was just GA, right? It was just general admission on the weekend. So you could have a choice of sitting on the, the normally corporate side, which is in the shade, beautiful, or you could sit on the Eastern side, which is great with the drums, with the front line, with the atmosphere, but it is also in the sun, right? So a lot of people did choose to go onto that other side, which is where the cameras weren't really on. Uh, the, sorry, the, the cameras... The cameras predominantly kind of obviously show towards that eastern side. So you didn't get to see a great deal of a crowd. But on the other side, there was, you know, there definitely was a, a great deal of people there. I think that we are building and we are we will definitely speak about this later on in the podcast. But it is really good to have seen at least, you know, 2,000 people get out to it. Because I have seen NRLW games this year in other places, not Gold Coast, that have had less than 1,000. Whether they tell you that's the numbers or not, or not. Because I can tell you right now, they can, you know, dilly-daddle those, uh, those figures up to... To really benefit the the numbers, right? It's it's very easy for clubs to actually do that. So you know, I, I do believe that we have the best NRLW support in the country. I will maintain that. I will stand by it. There is no team across the comp that brings the noise like Titans fans do. There is no team across the comp that that, that brings that same passion. Obviously, there's a ways to go. You know, we're still well and truly on the up in regards to crowd support for the women's. But, you know, why not? Why not get behind the women's right now? We don't have a men's team in the NRL finals. We're in. We're, we're more than likely going to be in the NRL finals. But even if we weren't, like, we've still got that extra two weeks here of, of being able to watch a team and have a team to support. And I think that it is a, a really underrated game. People still look at what the NRLW was five, six years ago when it just started, where the quality was... Uh, with all due respect, it wasn't great. Now it has come leaps and bounds since then and has a long way to go, but is on the process of on that go, right? So I'm really excited about the future of it. I know it can definitely grow. And if we get a home final, and this is the main thing here, as you were saying just then, Dane, if the Roosters lose and the Titans win, well, we get a home final. We will get a home final and we have a great record at home. Now, granted, we will have to play the Roosters at home, which will be a real tough one. Well, we obviously did lose them early on in the season, but getting a home final will be something that we just haven't, we, we don't really know about here on the Gold Coast. In the men's team, we haven't had a home final since 2010. And guess what? We won that. We won that. That was against the Warriors. It was actually our nice. only individual men's uh, finals win. Uh, men, yeah, finals win, actually, in general. Yeah. So, look, it's something that we, we want to achieve. I guarantee you we'll get a real significant amount of people out for that game on a standalone because you've got to remember this was a standalone game. And, yeah, look, I'm, I'm happy with it. Long way to go, but I'm very happy with it. I reckon 4,000. I reckon for finals with the right marketing behind the club, um, emails to our current men's members, etc. Um, you and I pushing it as much as we can. Then, um, then I, I would really hope that, yeah, four or five. I, I like that. I think that's a figure that's definitely achievable. And it would just be such an amazing sight to see. Uh, whilst I mentioned memberships there, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the 2024 membership expression of interest are now open. We did break our all-time membership record in 2023. We've got a new coach in 2024. Things are looking up. Fingers crossed we can all come together and break that record in back-to-back -back seasons. That would be really special. Uh, my whole family is signed up as Titans members, including my son, before he was even born. He's a quote-unquote pre-life member. Um, so how do you get in your expression of interest? You can call 07-5656-5656. Or you can email membersinfo at titans.com.au and register your interest. If you want to sit with the front line, Mention the podcast, mention the front line, um, see if you can get tickets in there. In my experience, it is the best place to really appreciate the atmosphere of a Titans home game. And we'd certainly love to, uh, here at the podcast, we certainly love to have you on board in the Titans front line or Absolutely. more broadly as a Titan member. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what I'll say to that as well is that, look, other places in the stadium may have its benefits, but where, what you get with us here in the front line is the craziness, right? You know, you, you don't get to hold back. You get to go full ball. We've got the drums pumping. We've got the chant singing. You know, we've got just everything we, we do is to create a crazy atmosphere, a crazy atmosphere for our team that really not many teams are able to achieve on a sole purpose like that. Like you do see, you know, the big teams and some other teams having that kind of audience and atmosphere, but we want to be able to really enforce it. And, and considering that we are actually a struggling club, when we get to become a good club, 
my goodness me, the, the atmosphere at Seabus will be pumping. I still maintain that the Gold Coast has obviously never won anything in our entire history. And, that, and that's just not rugby league. That's everything. AFL, they haven't even made the finals at the Gold Coast Suns. They've never made the finals in their history. The Titans, obviously, we haven't won a grand final. The basketball team didn't do anything. The A-League team didn't do anything. So we've never actually witnessed any kind of success on the Gold Coast. So if we're doing what we can right now and getting out and supporting our team and showing out the atmosphere, imagine what it's going to be when we're good. And we've got Desi Hasler, as you said, the Desi Special, coming in next season. We're on the up, man. We are building. We have a team here. Desi just needs to tinker, and it's going to get crazy in the front line. So, yeah, jump along with us, man. It's going to get wild. I did freeze momentarily while you were speaking there, but it came back um, with you saying that we're on the up, and I can absolutely agree with that. Really excited for 2024. Um, and, yeah, we'd love to have you as a Titans member if it's something you'd like to consider. Let's jump into our NRLW review. A win against the Eels, 34-12, to 12, a 22-point victory. Our biggest winning margin of the season, I believe, and arguably our best performance yet. Um, I want to ask you, how was the atmosphere with a smaller, but albeit probably more intimate crowd where I'm sure the girls could really hear the support? Uh, and would you agree that was our best game so far this year? That was definitely our best game so far this year. Yeah, to score 34 points every single week. I've been speaking about the fact that we are struggling to score points. That is our biggest issue this year. We're able to defend. We're one of the better defensive teams in the competition, but it really does come down to that attack and 34 points. I know it is against the last place Eels, but the fact of the matter is, is that we still went and did that. Look, I think that overall, man, it was it was a great atmosphere for people who were there. I don't know if you'd be able to really pick that up if you were at home, because obviously you do look at the eastern side and northern side and southern side didn't have any tickets for sale or whatnot. It was just the, the cornered off eastern side and then the entirety of the western kind of area. But the atmosphere was good, you know. Obviously, the vlog is out on BKR Sport YouTube if you want to go and have a look at what our atmosphere was like. We had Jamie Chapman jump on the vlog as well. But the girls love it. The girls absolutely love it. Jessica Ellison, the first thing she did as she was walking over was saying how good it was to hear that noise. And look, to be honest with you, man, the, the women's don't have this kind of support across kind of any faction right now like uh, across the league there's no one really like what we create you know when they're at home and they've got a great record at home they've got this massive noise most of the time for all these other teams they've got the men's that what they're waiting for but with us we care just as much about the women's as we do about the men's and if you were there in attendance you know that noise was really really good so i think this really differentiates us from a lot of, a lot of other teams and it really did give a push to our girls because we did go down early and we were able to find a way back into it and then just absolutely go bang 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 and we'll talk about the uh, the, the chat by machine in a in a second but look yeah really really happy with the noise that we were making it does make it louder as well when there's actually not as many people there you can really hear the reverberations of the drums and that's what the girls was saying Lauren Brown was talking about that as well so yeah very happy with that one man but look it was just good to get a win and a really really big win at that as well I think if you look at the EEL season 32 points well I don't think I know I looked it up while you were speaking uh, so I'm not going to claim to be some mastermind here uh, but 32 <laughs> points is exactly what they concede and we scored on that which you know you look at the Eels yes they're struggling but if other teams are averaging the same amount and we thought our attack was a concerning sign, and we know our defense is great, we were right on that average with other teams. So I think that in itself there um, is a, a really, really good sign. I have to admit, I thought conceding a try in the first three minutes was, again, a really poor start, which is something that has really worried me throughout this season. I went through and did the average. Uh, on average this year, we conceded our first try in 10 minutes, which is obviously not great. Some have come as early as one minute against the Roosters. So it is something... We have to be mindful of come finals, uh, assuming we are there, which I believe we will be, for that particular try that the first one. I just think it was an uncharacteristic error by Politi, and the Eels just had more people around the ball. They just wanted it a little bit more. So purely an effort area. And why, why I can't be too upset with it was the effort immediately switched. It was, hey, we should have been around that football there. No one dropped their heads. They said, let's just forget about that and just get back to our game plan. And once we got back to that, we were unstoppable. In this game, I loved how Kiriaratu took on the line. And with Lauren Brown managing the game perfectly at seven, it's the exact role we needed her to play. And then you consider she pivoted out to the wing at stages, was defending at center. She's shown insane versatility in that game. I was really, really impressed. As for the attack, I wanted to single out a single area, and I just couldn't. The inside running was fantastic. The edge hole running was awesome by our back rowers. The forwards momentum up the middle. Everything in this game, attack-wise, was bang on perfect. 
We controlled possession well. We had seven line breaks to two. We made 30 more tackle breaks. A really pleasing performance. And to go back to an old phrase, it doesn't matter how you skin this cat. It was a bloody great performance by our girls. Uh, Any final words from you before we get to our three, two, ones? Yeah, absolutely, man. I think this was a a much needed win for us in big terms as well to really gain that confidence. And this is what we've been speaking about for a while. We needed that confidence booster. Again, if we won games, it'd be by small margins. Our points differential is 14 right now. So that includes this massive win here that was by 22 points, right? So uh, you take that off and we're into the negatives. This really helped us to gain that confidence. Now, look, you look at the, the Titans in third position on 12 points. We are on the same amount of points as the Roosters. However, the Roosters have plus 140 to our 14. So we aren't really able to compete with that at all in regards to differential, which is why we need them to lose to the Cowboys, which is going to be a tough one because the Cowboys have been struggling recently. Uh, And then you go down and have a look at the Broncos are on plus 57 right now. So if they win and we lose, we're definitely below them. And as you said before, if the Raiders beat us by 11, then we we would drop out of the finals. Uh, But yeah, look, I think that it's... um, it's, it's it's a very much needed win for us. We needed to win that game by a significant amount. We went and did it. We had the home crowd behind us. I thought that our front row forwards, I still maintain are the best front row forwards in the game. You know, Shannon Martha and Jessica Elliston are absolutely fantastic as what they uh, as what we have. Uh, you know, it really is phenomenal. And Georgia Hale doing what she does best in that 13. Shaley Bent and Zara Canfield doing what they need to do. Our forward pack is actually unbelievable. And I'm really, really loving it. Uh, and just every single part of it is working right now. And then it would just wait it. We were just waiting for that moment where the back line would click and we'd start to get that those halves working. And I think that Shante Kereratu is really coming into our own alongside Lauren Brown at the halves right now. You know, it's really providing a bit of a conundrum for when we do get to Leah Fuimaona back, who was a great player who we've been waiting for. But now Shante's playing well. You've got Lauren Brown playing well on the seven. You know, it's just working pretty much everywhere for us at the moment. Brittany Bralinardi obviously playing I don't know. It, it really does provide a nice conundrum to have. But yeah, look, much needed win and uh, just love how our four pack is playing at the moment. And Talia Fuimano is named in reserves this week. We don't know if she's going to return yet, but named in reserves. So we'll have to pay attention to the team list uh, 24 hours before kickoff and see if she's still there or if she gets cut. Uh, let's jump into our three, two, ones for our win over the Eels. Now you predicted, and I already know who you're going to say, because you <laughs> predicted her as the MVP <laughs> last week. I jumped on board and copied you with a prediction also, which I'm glad I did. But you've had a real knack for predicting um, the MVP for the whole season, MVPs in certain games. So go ahead and tell us who was your three points this week. I think you definitely knew who my three points was going to be going to this week once you received a message on Facebook immediately after the game. Mm-hmm. It might have even been during the game. I can't remember where I just started screaming, Chapo, Chapo, Chapo. Jamie Chapman, how phenomenal was she? Three line breaks in the game, but guess what? Three tries in the game. She was absolutely phenomenal. I told you last week, I'm just waiting for that big game for her. She's an origin representative. She knows what she's doing. You know, centers and wingers really rely on their their inside halves. And Kiriaratu and Lauren Brown were able to really help her out this week. And guess what? Chapman scored those three tries. Got 74 uh, fantasy points. Had 207 run meters there with 28 post-contact meters. You know, uh, seven tackle breaks as well, which is absolutely phenomenal. And you could just see the sheer class that she does have. But the class was really, really shown in that game that that she is an origin representative footballer. So, yeah, Chapo definitely gets the, the three points for mine. I also obviously interviewed her in the... Uh, we, we interviewed her on the, the vlog, so you guys can check that out now. I am here with a woman who just absolutely tore up the city of Parramatta, Jamie Chapman. How do you feel about that one? I'm pretty pumped. Um, good to come here, and, and they come here and on our home turf and get the two points, and yeah. Well, I thought it was pretty loud here today. We got to support the girls really well, and obviously no boys game, so it was all the focus on you girls. How's that feel for the public come yeah, out? Yeah, it was amazing, the atmosphere. We just ran out so many fans, not even a boys game. It's just an all-women's match, and to see how many people turned up for us, it, you know, it means a lot. We love you guys coming out. Thank you. Well, it's all about the Gold Coast community, and we're coming. We're getting that home final. We're getting that home final. Yeah. Chapo was fantastic, so I'm assuming you went the three points with her as well absolutely had to uh an attacking masterclass. what i really love from el chapo and this one was her inside hole running that el change <laughs> <laughs> that's a good nickname isn't it <laughs> it is a good nickname it's just it's funny if people know who el chapo is it's <laughs> Ho- hopefully it sticks took me uh, off guard hopefully took me she, off guard. It was a funny she one, likes though. it first and if she does like it hopefully it sticks and if not i apologize uh, but yeah, El Chapo, the, the inside hole running there was just phenomenal. And it's something I really want to see more of. That change of direction 
really disrupted the Eels line. And I think it's something we can also use as a decoy. Once defenses really start to click it and become aware of how potent that is, we could see the inside defender almost freeze up in anticipation that Chapo is coming on the inside as we then give a wider ball to our outside backs there. That really, really promising signs there moving forward. For my two points, I was really split between Jessica Elliston and Shannon Marto, as I am most weeks. I'm going to go Marto. She had 20 runs for 188 tackles, and she also had 24, uh, sorry, 188 meters and also 24 tackles. Now, in this game, it's easy to look at all of our outside backs that were really dominant and put on an attacking display, but that doesn't happen happen in footy unless your middle forwards are dominating. I think Marto, also Elliston, they were both big, big reasons for that. So my two points goes to Marto, who gets your two points. Mine's going to go to the young talent, Shante Kiriaratu. I thought she was fantastic in that 5-8 role. I think that we needed that from her because, as we've been saying in, in recent podcasts as well, with her and Sienna, it wasn't necessary. That's Sienna Lafippo. It wasn't necessarily working out because they're both at the same stage of their careers. They needed an experienced half alongside them, whether it be Shante or whether it be Sienna. And Shante has got the gig. She's got Lauren there, and she's absolutely killed in this game. She had two tries here. Uh, she was absolutely fantastic every single time that she had the ball. It was it really worked out with her. Um, had 58 running meters as well for the 5 a Had a couple of uh, line breaks, a line break assists. Uh, try assist as well. She had a couple of tackle breaks. So, look, I think it's definitely something to to shout her out for that she has had one of those games where she really did need to have. Did have a couple of missed tackles, which is a, a little bit on the negative side, but did make a, a, a decent amount of tackles for, for a half as well. So, yeah, look, obviously still work to be done, but I definitely think this was a bit of a breakout game for her in that 5-8 role to, to really push Talia Fuimono for that spot. She gets my one point. Uh, Kiri Oratu, I, just, I was so impressed with how she started the game at 5-8, show and go to score that try, but then was forced to go out to the wing temporarily. At stages, it looked like she was defending in center. Uh, I was really, really impressed with her ability to adapt to the situation and play a number of positions for us um, in a really important victory. So I gave her my one point. Who got your one point? My one point actually goes to the other front rower, Jessica Ellison. Like, I could have given it to Shannon Marto. They both have very similar stats there. Shannon Marto obviously does beat her out in regards to run meters with 188 run meters comparatively to Ellison's 133. It's still absolutely monster run meters from the both of them there. Obviously, Jessica Ellison got a try in this game as well, which you're very, very happy with there. Um, they're, they're both very, very similar. Obviously, uh, Ellison did get the line break. They've got similar post-contact meters there. Uh, had a tackle break as well there, Jessica Elliston. Look, I thought that she was great. So again, it comes back to what I said at the beginning of the podcast is that I think that we've got the best front row pairing in the game in Shannon Marto and Elliston. And, and I said this last week as well, when one of these girls has a really exceptional game, we have the other one kind of here, just a little bit below, but nothing too drastic below. So they're all they're always competing at a high level. And then it will swap. And then it'll be Shannon Marto here and Ellison here and then Ellison here and Shannon Marto there. So it's really good that we have really high quality front rowers who really just throw their bodies at the line, make great post contact meters, make great meters, and really lead us from the front. I genuinely believe that we have the best front row duo in the business. So uh, yeah, very happy with Jessica Elliston and definitely have to give a, a shout out to Shannon Marto as well. I echo that we have the best middle for, uh, best middle forwards. And I think if you add Locke into that equation as well with Georgia Howe, then really it, it doesn't really become a question across the NRLW. Uh, what I love most about Jess's try was she didn't just steamroll anyone. She actually steamrolled Kennedy Charrington, one of the best defenders who um, is right up there, played for Australia, played for the Blues. And she steamrolled her and made her look like an amateur, which is you know something I've never really seen happen to Kennedy Charrington before. So that was a really impressive run by Jess there. Just all energy to come up with that try. Let's jump into our NRLW preview. We're against the Raiders at GIO Stadium Sunday at 3.15 p.m. So we come up against the fifth place Canberra Raiders side. And they have a 5-3 and three record in comparison to our 6-2 and two record. They are coming off a win against the Cowboys. Strangely, by the exact same score that we actually beat the Eels by, which is interesting. Uh, prior to that, they lost to, uh, they lost to the Knights by 8 points. And they lost to the Broncos by 32 points. So I think it's fair to say this is a Raiders side that has mixed form coming into this one. 
How do you see this one? Do you think our Titans can get it done? Yeah, well, I was watching that game actually live at Seabus. That was the first game of the doubleheader between the, the Raiders and the Cowboys. And we wanted the Cowboys to obviously win, but they weren't able to get the job done. Look, the Raiders, you look at their, their four, and as in point score, they've got 167 to our 134. So they're, they're beating us out by about 33 points in regards to the points scored. But again, that's been our biggest struggle this year besides the last game that we haven't been able to score points. Defensively, though, we are much better than the Raiders. We've only given up 100. 20 points to their 176. So that's definitely something that we can be happy about. Uh, we are the third best team for points uh, for uh, defense at the moment. We're just behind the Roosters who have given up 104. So we're still only 16 off the Roosters and then 111 for the Knights. We're only nine off the Knights. We've got a very good defensive team here. And that big win over the Eels actually has propelled us from second last on the attack to above the Cowboys, obviously above the Eels. And now we are also above the Tigers. But the concerning thing is... We are still below the Sharks, the Dragons, the Raiders, the Broncos, the Roosters, and Knights uh, by decent little amounts there uh, in regards to points scored. So, look, that is still a little bit concerning. However, look, we go down there. We've got some great momentum right now after that win over the Eels. We've got to really utilize that. Hopefully, we'll have Clarkey in attendance down there in Canberra, get out to support our girls. You know, he can be the uh, the BKR sport of getting some chance started down there at GIO Stadium and get really mess with their clap. You know, I know, you know, in Canberra, they've got the Viking clap. Well, you need to mess with their clap, son. That's what I did when I was down there and I expected a view. Uh, but yeah, look, I think the Titans have a really good chance of winning this game. I think if you go through and have a look at the player-by-player the -player position, as we do every week, Appy Nichols versus Ivania Politi. Now, Appy actually used to play for the Titans, but I do give that to Politi there in the fullback. We go to the wings of Madison Bartlett and Shakaya Tungai versus Destiny Minnesota Party and Karina Brown. I think Karina Brown's been actually really, really good in recent weeks, and I think she's really, you know, pushing Emily Bus to to maybe not get back into the squad right this very second, or maybe uh, Emily will have to go up against Destiny Minnesota Party. I'm not too sure there, but you know, I was speaking to Emily after the game on the weekend. I believe she might be back for this game. Uh, she was saying she was hoping to be back for this game, so it would be great to see her because she is a great player, Emily. But with our wingers right now. They are both going really, really well. They are going really, really well. So I will say that our wing pairing does beat out their wing pairing, but Madison Bartlett is a really quality player as well. Look, you go into the centers of Shia Robbins, Retty, and Mackenzie Wiki. You're going up against Jamie Chapman, who just scored three tries, is an origin representative, and Noel Williams Guthrie as well in the centers. Our center pairing does win that. The 5'8", Shante Kutaratu and Lauren Brown in the half going up against Zahara Tamara, who's their captain, and Ashley Quinlan. Zahara Tamara is a quality player, but I think the form that our two halves are possessing right at this current moment with the couple of wins that we've got on the trot, I'm taking our Titans women's there. I really am. I'm taking the women. The front row forward of Jessica Ellison and Shannon Martov against Tamea kelly Sines and Sophie Holliman. You don't even have to ask me twice. You don't have to ask me twice at all. I'm telling you, our front row pairing is the best in the business. Number nine is Shante Tamara versus Brittany Brallinati. I'm taking Brittany Brallinati. Back row, Mona Lisa Soliola and Elise Smith versus Zara Canfield and Shaley Bent. I love the duo of Canfield and Bent in regards to Bent being the X Factor and Canfield just doing the hard work and doing what she needs to do. I think that I'm taking our girls again. And then when it comes to the 13, Samima Talfa versus Georgia Hale is our captain. I really do think that Samima Talfa is a great player. I think she is actually a really, really hard-nosed worker. Has played for the Eels. I think she was in the Eels grand final team last year. But Georgia Hale is just too damn well good. She's too good. She's too damn well good. So I think that we beat them out in every single aspect. I said this about the Eels. And guess what I'm saying about the Raiders again this week? I know the Raiders are a better team. But overall, we are the better team of the two, in my personal opinion. That's why we're in third position. That's why we've got the wins to our name. And I think it's going to be a nice little win for us. Yeah, I agree with your assessment there of all. And it's funny because Georgia Hale, every other week, you haven't really had to think if she's the best player. This is probably the closest matchup there is because Simone Taufa is a genuine gun and someone who held uh, tackling records before Hale overtook them. Um, and our bench is stronger as well, I believe. We've got great versatility actually... there with Lefipo. Yeah, I just want to jump in here quickly and say, how good is Riley Jorgensen? You know, how good oh. is this girl? She's absolutely phenomenal. When she, I feel, and I said this in one of the Facebook comments, honestly, I feel her tackles vibrate my soul. I feel the tackle in my soul. She is an absolute bomb when it comes to coming on the field and just smashing women, just absolutely smashing them. If guys still have this thought process that the women don't tackle hard, Gee whiz, watch Riley Jorgensen. She is absolutely unreal in throwing her body the line. That's what I should have said when we were talking about. I, went, I, I missed out on the interchange there, but my goodness me, how good is Riley Jorgensen? 
Riley Jorgensen is, for me, the player in future years that will be someone we can bring on at lock, someone we can bring on at prop, and someone we can bring on at back row. Because she brings that certain energy about her game, and it's not particular in any one strength, it's just a ball of energy that's going to give you 100%. I think she makes great forward utility that can really cover anywhere in that pack for us. I want to get her age. It's not on our website, but I feel like she's still under 20 years old. Yeah, do, do I don't believe... Head? Well, she... Yeah, it doesn't actually have it here. Um, mm. I could check. Because well, you keep talking, I'll have, a look. The, I'll have a look. Yeah, while we look up that, I believe uh, Riley might have been played in the under-19s women game this year. Um, I think for me, going back to this Raiders game, the thing that makes them so dangerous is the fact that they genuinely have everything to lose. I know typically you would say that the other way around, they've got nothing to lose, but I think that's what makes them dangerous. This is the definition of do or die for them. Um, they cannot play finals with a loss, but they can with a win. So it doesn't have to be a complicated message from the coach. It needs to be as simple as, hey, you need to go out and win. I do think if you look at this form and roster-wise like we just did, we have them covered. And I don't have concerns that we will lose this game based on what I've seen on the regular season from our side and the Raiders. But I just think the fact that they're going to be desperate, it is something we need to be aware of and it is something we need to match and be equally as desperate. We need to get the win in this one just so there's no stress and we know we're locked in for finals equations. Absolutely. They do average 21 points, which is about four more than us this year. And their set completion is at 75%, which is higher than us also. That being said, we do average more tackle breaks and less missed tackles. We actually average 39 tackle breaks per game, which is the highest of any NRLW side, which I was surprised about because, you know, you, you look at the stats and arguably we don't have the best attack. It's not our strongest point, but the tackle breaks are there. So the opportunities are there. And I suspect as our spine keeps gelling, the points will come hopefully in the final. So I just think if we can keep our attack sharp this round, like we did against the Eels, and really avoid getting dragged into a nitty-gritty style of play that Raiders, NRL and NRLW realistically like playing, we should win this one quite clearly. There is every opportunity for me in this one that we head into the break with a sizable lead and the Raiders completely drop their heads in the second half and go, well, this is, our season's over. We're not coming back from that margin. So for that reason, because we're on the eve of finals, I actually am going to tip us 13+. plus. I think we can build some real confidence in this one and hit the finals on a great winning streak. And I think we can have this one done by halftime with the right attitude because I really think the Raiders will drop their heads if we build up a big score heading into the break. Uh, I'll go to you for if you found anything on Riley Jorgensen first and then your final prediction and maybe another MVP one. Yeah, it's very difficult here. There's some conflicting reports. I can tell you that I can rule out the one that has Riley Jorgensen on uh, some random website at 42. I can rule that one out. Uh, <laughs> but there's a couple here that one says one says 16, one says 20, one says 18. So I'm just going to take a stab at it and throw, because it says here that I believe she would play in the under-19s this year, maybe for yep. C Burley or Queensland or whatnot. So I'm going to take a, a random guess and say she might be 19 or 20. Uh, so don't hold us to that, guys. I've tried to look for it, but on the official website of the Titans and also of um, the NRL, it doesn't actually have her age. But point of matter is, is that she is uh, young and ready to absolutely pop off in the NRLW, and we're seeing that right now. In regards to my tip for this game, I don't think that we'll win 13 plus, but I will say we will win 1 to 12. We are away from home. We don't have that crazy drummer there. The, the, the drums going yeah. wild. I. I I think that we win this game based off the fact that we are the better team, but the, the Raiders are going to be desperate, right? And I think the the Raiders know, right, because they can't actually achieve above the Broncos anyway, unless the Raiders lost by, like, <laughs> one, and the Broncos lost by 60, and they'd still actually still be above the Raiders there. So the Raiders have to win this game. I do think they'll be desperate in front of their own home crowd, but also how many people are going to turn up there at Geo Stadium, which is a little bit a little bit out of the kind of area uh, for people to, to drive out there. Uh, so, I don't know. I think Titans win this game 1-12. I can see a world where, we, world where we win this game 13+. plus. But the Raiders being desperate might give us a little bit of a scare. But we've got the better team. We've got the better team. So, I'm going to take our Titans girls. And I'm going to say, who do I say as our MVP in this game? That is a real good one. Our MVP. I've been pretty good with these recently. Yeah, I'm going to copy you. So, whatever yeah. you say, I'm going as well. You know what? You can go. Who do you say? I think Polite, uh, Polite, I think she's due a big one. 
Um, but it, it, so I'll say, yeah, I'll lock in our star fullback I wanted for my to, MVP prediction. Yeah, I wanted to see if you, who you would say first, just so that we can really come back for us. You don't copy my papers. You know, you don't copy <laughs> my papers. In regards to this game, geez, who do I look for? Um, I, I do see this as a game that Georgia Howe really can just lead from the front again. I think this would be a forwards battle, to be completely honest with you. I think that the Raiders do... Uh, do give up a few points here and there, but I just I'm really looking towards Georgia Hale here as as the one that really takes over this game and and leads from the front. She's making a million tackles. You know she just knows how to. I feel like this could be a grindy game, a real gritty and grindy game where it'll come down to the wire. So I'm going to say Georgia Hale is the MVP. I know that might be a little bit of a cop out, but with that being said, with the form of our backline, I could have easily looked at a Politi. I could have easily looked at a, a Jamie Chapman again, to be honest with you, and even Karina Brown. You know uh, maybe even Shante. Could there are two, but I will take Georgia Hale. Gritty game. Canberra knows has been gritty. I'll take us 1-12, and I'll say Georgia Hale is our girl. I love that pick, and just from myself quickly, before we move on to our Burley Bears, uh, I will be there with the family representing the front line, um, sitting on the eastern side there. I believe it's the the, the Larkham stand, not the Meninga stand, um, right near the front on the 50. So if you are there as a Titans fan, please come up, say hello, and um, join join the front line there. We'll um, represent proudly in the nation's capital. And let's go into around the grounds. Burley Bears defeat Wynnum Manly Seagulls 57 to 8. Keep in mind, this was a prelim final. Um, you don't see that too often in, in prelim finals. It was an absolute thrashing. They advanced to the Q Cup grand final. Now, we did have more Titans feature in this game than when we originally broke it down and anticipated. Team lists did change before kickoff, those being Keanu Kinney. Ken Mamalo, Tony Francis, Isaac Fa'asumala Awi, and Jacob Arlick. Now, I'm not sh- too sure what happened there if our club was withholding them and saying no. I don't know what happened, but they weren't even in the reserves. So something happened behind the scenes where Queensland Cup allowed them to return. Maybe they had to wait to be cleared as eligible. I don't know. We didn't think they were playing. They did play. We kind of felt Burley would be too good regardless. Though. We tipped them 13 plus. Then when you add our Titans boys in, you know, there's just so much premiership muscle there that it wasn't even a question. Um, so over to you. How did our Titans go in this prelim final? Mate, we went absolutely fantastic. You couldn't go past what we <laughs> did. You know, Keanu Kenny was absolutely unbelievable. This guy was just ridiculous. And we we know this is what Keanu Kenny can do. Two tries in the game, 218 meters, which is the most of any player. Three line breaks and nine tackle breaks. Nine tackle breaks. Nine tackle breaks. That is absolutely absurd. Kinney is a star talent that we just need to find a way in future years to find his way into the Titans team. But then again, we have JC and we have AJ. Where do you put him? Tony Francis, one try, 90 meters and three tackle breaks. Uh, only has, He had zero kick return meters, which is quite you know interesting there. That's, really that's strange, a strange. Hey, because Ken Mamalo had something like 80 and Kinney was recorded for 30. So I, I didn't watch the game. I'm not sure if they didn't kick to Tony at all or if Q-Cup stuffed up the stats there. But 90 metres with zero as kick return metres is actually really good for a winger. Yeah, maybe they were just trying to target Kenny Mamalo or, or, or mm. target the size of Kenny. I'm not too sure. But yeah, that's weird that he has zero recorded uh, kick return metres. Kenny Mamalo had one try, 189 metres, and one line break and eight tackle breaks. So we had a lot of tackle breaks in this game. Yeah. Isaac Fasul Malawi, 48 minutes for 202 metres, 84 post contact, four tackle breaks, two offloads, and 17 tackles for zero missed. That is a monster game there by Isaac Fasul Malawi. Uh, Jacob Alec, 80 minutes for 106 metres, five tackle breaks, four offloads, and 22 tackles. So really good game there by our boys. And obviously, yeah, we, we are just on a roll at the moment. You know, they're just absolutely pumping through teams. You go back and have a look at, at their recent record, 57-8 against Winner Manly. They beat the, the Central Queensland Capras 38-12. They beat the Blackhawks 20-12. They beat the, the Mackay Cutters 24-10. Winner Millie Seagulls again 35-6. They had that draw with the Pride 22-20, but before that obviously lost to the Dolphins 38-6. So they're on a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is their seventh game straight if they win. This is their seventh game straight if they win. So yeah, absolutely flying right now. The Burley Bears, very happy with it. And I think what pleased me most about that was... Young guys like Kinney, they're kind of at this point in their career where we're getting a pretty good read on them. And in such an important finals game, they lived up to everything they thought they were, right? We knew Kinney had X factor. He delivers that with a double. We knew Tony Francis was a consistent winger that's not going to let you down. He delivers with almost 100 metres and a try. We know Kevin Marlowe is a veteran. He delivers with great stats. Isaac Fasuma, we know he works hard in the middle. 200 plus metres in 48 minutes. 
is genuinely insane. That's some of the best minute for minute stats you'll see in footy. And Jacob Arlick, I, I love that he had the five tackle breaks and the four offloads because it really goes back to what we saw in his debut where he's prepared to chance his arm, throw the offload, break a tackle, look for opportunities. So I loved how our Titans performed in this one. And I think it's really important, particularly for the younger guys. I'm talking Isaac, Arlick, and Kinney, that fingers crossed that the Bears beat the Tigers this weekend. Our players will get grand final experience against the New South Wales Cup premiers in back-to-back weeks, being the Q Cup grand final and then the state challenge on grand final day. And generally for Titans fans going to the grand final, um, if you already did book your tickets earlier in the year, that was brave, but we respect it. Um, You know, you will have players to watch for the Bears, hopefully, and hopefully our NRLW side is there. So it still could be a great day for Titans if things continue to pan out uh, in our favour. I think as well, just quickly before we jump on to the next next topic, is that you look at this uh, this Brisbane Tigers team and that yeah. we're actually also really lucky the Storm are playing this week. So because the Melbourne Storm in the men's game lost to the Broncos in such you know spectacular fashion, the Melbourne Storm obviously have to play all their players against the Sydney Roosters in Melbourne this week. So that means that this Brisbane Tigers team doesn't get the benefit of having a lot of those other talented players that they could have had. You know, they've still got Kane Bradley who, is locked in with the Storm. Same with George Jennings. Riley Jacks has played for him before. Uh, Jordan Grant. But overall, we've actually, we're playing Lever Harpulu, who used to play for the Gold Coast Titans quite a few years back. But overall, this hmm. uh, Brisbane Tigers team, look, I think that we're very lucky. We're, I, I believe the Billy Bears win this game regardless in the grand final against the Tigers. I think the form is just too surreal. But they're, they're lucky that we don't have to go up against a- any more of the Storm boys who potentially would have been set down to the Host Plus Cup to play in that grand final. We are lucky. And just going through the Tigers roster, I believe this could be former Titans player Corey Thompson's final ever professional rugby league game. Yeah. He's at fullback for the Tigers. Uh, yeah. They've also got Riley Jackson in their lineup, a former Titan. Uh, you go down to Leo Pulu, who you mentioned. Charlie Murray is their lock. He never debuted with us, but did play a few preseason trials. Um, and then interestingly, Cole Guy is on the bench for them as well, who's actually Cameron Smith's godson and uh, Mark Guy's son. So, And he grew up, sorry, I should say, playing for the Crumbin Seagulls in the Gold Coast region. So there's a lot of Titans in that lineup as well. It's going to be a great game. Our Titans are named this week, guys, so there's no uh, surprises, I suppose, like last week. The same legends that got it done last week are going to get it done this week. My prediction is Bears 13 plus. I just think they're in such a great spot. I I can't see um, how that stops. I think they get seven in a row and feature on grand final day. Uh, Kinney, MVP again for me. What are your predictions for that one? I'm taking 13 plus as well. I think this... This Burley Bears side is just too dominant right now, especially with the littered talent of Keanu Kinney, Tony Francis, Sammy Sawalima has been playing for a long time as well. He's a great player. Kenny Mamalo, ex-Titan Tyron Roberts, uh, Isaac Fasso Malawi has been great. Obviously, Paddy Politoni has been there for quite some time, so he knows how to get the job done there. Jacob Alec as well. He's playing in the back row. And then their bench is just fantastic. And Vaka Sikaheli, who is actually contract to the Titans as well. You know, we have a really, really dominant team. So, look, Josiah Pahulu is also on the reserves, who is an up and coming for the Titans. So I would love to see him get a crack. But yeah, overall, man, I think 13 plus. I think, look, I love Koza. I love Corey Thompson. But he's just going to have to feel the uh, the wrath of the, the Titans boys, the current Titans boys here this weekend. And I'll say Titans 13 plus. I believe it's at Redcliffe as well. So let's go show the Redcliffe faithful, uh, you know, how to win the uh, the host plus cup. Yeah, you're right. It's at Redcliffe, 5.30 p.m. Also on KO Sports on the Sunday. Uh, which does mean, you know, with the NRL finals being on Friday, Saturday, there is still footy there for you on the Sunday, as well as our girls back to back there. Uh, And I just went through and counted 13 current or former Titans in the lineup of both sides there. So that's pretty exciting as well. Now, what we're going to do as far as our NRL side is concerned, we're going to do a breakdown of players, season, games, future predictions. We're going to go pretty comprehensively. But we're going to do it week to week. So the core focus will still remain our NRLW side uh, whilst they go through to the grand final and win it, of course. Uh, But we want to break down our men's side each week as well. So we're going to go through and review our backs today. Now, obviously, we have a few backs, so we're not going to spend too long on each player. We're just going to give a a few sentences each and then give them a rating out of 10. Now, for myself and for our viewers, the rating out of 1 to 10 that I will assign to each player is based around the circumstances of which their season played out. What I mean by that is the ceiling for Thomas Weaver being a 10 is much lower than what a ceiling for Kieran Foran as a 10 would be. For example, 
because Kieran Foran is someone who's played more. He played more games. He had larger expectations. Um, are you going to do your one to tens the exact same way? Pretty much, man. Yeah, look, obviously you look at the, the circumstances and the situation surrounding it as well. So it can't be just based off of one pure, just one simple reflection. It has to be off of the individual circumstances, yeah. Yeah, I agree, man. It'd be unfair to go like, oh, Tom Weaver, I'm giving him a two because he only played three games. It's, it's not really a fair representation. Uh, so we'll go through first name A to Z. I'll kick us off with Aaron Shop. Now, I actually thought Aaron was good this year without being great. And I do think Titans fans, because he stood out a little bit more on a struggling Bulldog side, might have expected a bit too much from him. He did play 18 games this year, and he had three tries and assists combined. Defensively at 84.5% and averaged 108 meters, uh, meters. I was disappointed with reports that he was looking to leave earlier this year, though they do remain unconfirmed. But I think Shoppy's given himself a base to improve on in 2024, which I'm excited for now that he's fully set on the coast. I'm going to give him a 7 out of 10. I think our fans have been a little bit harsh on him this year. Do you see it that way as well? I would agree. I, w- I would agree for the most part. I think this wasn't, you know, Aaron's best year, and I think he would know that himself. You know, he definitely would set the bar pretty high for himself. And and unfortunately, this year at a new club, he wasn't really able to fully get, I guess, nestled in, especially with the ever-changing, you know, surroundings of the Gold Coast Titans. We did lose Justin Holbrook, who brought him in, and obviously brought in Desi Hasler. There has been an issue with centers at this club for a little bit now that people complain about. I do think that, look, again, Aaron didn't have his best year. He would admit to that. I do think that he was actually better defensively than people do make out, though. Like, I remember that Sharks game, as I've said before. A Sharks game, people hounded him for his defense, but he didn't actually miss a tackle. I think that overall, look, his attack may not have been what we wanted. However, we knew how to score points this year. So we don't actually need him to score tries if someone else is scoring the tries and we're getting a lot of them. Lothie broke records this year. We had Phil Sami. You know, we've we've got the Brian Kelly did what he needed to do. We've got a fullback with JC or AJ Brimson who is scoring tries flo- uh, flowing as well. So look, I think that, yeah, a little bit harsh from the fans overall this year. I would go and say a, I would say a six. I think that he can definitely do better. I think that I don't think it was as bad as people say, but I, I think he can do better. I really look forward to him under Desi Hasler, though. As I said last week, with with one of the questions we had was, um, you know, which player do we think will succeed the most under Desi? I think that it could be Aaron. I think Aaron could really work well under Desi. The structure, the defensive structure he has, because Shuppy is a better defensive player than people make out. So I'll give him a six, but I do know that he has a lot more. To give to this club. And I, I love what you said there about improving under Des Hasler. I think that's a huge possibility. Um, Aaron seems like the sort of player that will respond well to a hard-nosed coach that's going to keep him on the straight and narrow, fully focused. I have seen a lot of hate comments online towards Aaron. I'm not sure if he sees them. I hope he doesn't. Uh, but just from the Gold Coast Titans Frontline Podcast, mate, we love you. We think you're a great player and we're looking forward to seeing you next year. Let's go to AJ Brimson. 14 games this year with 16 tries and assists combined. Played one game for the Maroons there in game three and probably wasn't at his best in the rep arena. But I can't speak highly enough of this pers- uh, this player rather, and his attitude this year. Uh, I thought his attitude was really, really great and you know, really reflected and, and rubbed off onto others. 2024 is even more exciting with a potential positional change there, potentially a floating role like we've seen players like Latrell have at center, Turbo and Origin, which work really well. So for Brimson, though statistically not his best season, I'm actually going to go an 8 out of 10. I thought he was really, really important, but a great attitude every week. Uh, What are you going to rate Brimo in a word on his season, please? I think that I'm going to... I'm going to say that it wasn't his greatest year by any means, but that was more so due to the injuries. He did pick up quite a few injuries this year. I remember the one at Manly. He's had a couple of them throughout the season, which did stunt his you know, consistency and stunt the ability for him to, to really knuckle down and absolutely smash out what he can achieve. AJ is an electric talent. We know what he can produce. I'm going to give him a 7 out of 10. I definitely think it was above par. I think he did everything he can. I love his attitude for this club. I know AJ very, very well. He's a great bloke, and I know that he absolutely wants every bit of success for this team. I think that he'd probably agree that, look, he's got a lot more that he can offer as long as those injuries don't really come into his game as they have been in specifically this season. I'd say this season has been the harshest one for him in regards to injuries. So, yeah, I think he had 14 games this year, uh, did everything that he could, I just think it comes down to, the, unfortunately, the injury curse. So I will go with the 7 out of 10, but we all know that he can have a 10 out of 10 season next year. And for Brimo as well, there wasn't like you know, a broken bone that you kind of recover from and, and you're good. There were soft tissue injuries, 
which we know have such a high rate of reoccurring, such the hamstrings, calves, etc. Um, I'll let you go first for this next one, so don't hog uh, all the comments. Let's go to Alofiana Khan Pereira. Uh, how did you see his year? Yeah, with Alofi Anakam Pereira, he was really good this year. I think that defensive, he might have slowed down a little bit later on in the year. It wasn't uh, maybe his greatest end of the season. Uh, and maybe the defensive area of the game was was definitely left wanting a bit more. His 70.3% for defensive tackle efficiency, which compares to a lot of other guys who are like 80, 85 and whatnot. But we do have to remember it is his first year. And he did break a record with the club for tries this year. So for a rookie coming into a team that that did have a lot of changing stuff. Again, Desi, Justin, you know, we had all the off-field issues. We had those falling apart games in the first half of the season. You know, I think that Loffy did everything that he could. So I would actually give him an 8.5 out of 10. I think that he absolutely deserves a, a really big positive rap. Did what he needed to do. You know what? I'll give him an 8, actually. I'll give him an 8. Just because the defensive tackle efficiency is a little bit low and he does need to bump that up. But I definitely, I'm going to give him an 8, yeah. There were stages this year where AKP was dropped. Uh, and I do agree, towards the end of the year, his form probably did dip a little. I'm not sure if that's an attitude thing or just purely being a rookie, right, and trying to apply um, that killer mentality across a, a regular season. Did play 23 games this year and break the, the record for the most ever tries in a Titans season. So I, I think that uh, us being critical is probably just we know how much talent he has. Um, I guess myself, if I had to pick a down part of Loffy's year, only 35 tackle breaks and averaging 113 metres, which is quite low for a winger. Um, example, Ken Mamalo, our Q cut winger, averages much greater tackle breaks and metres without the tries. But I am keen to see him build on that area of his game. And because he's a rookie, I'm actually going to go an 8.5 out of 10. I think for a rookie, there was much more good in, in Loffy's game this year than there was bad. Uh, our next player is Brian Kelly. Now, he had 21 games this year for 15 tries and assists combined, and his tackling efficiency was 81% with 141 metres averaged. Like Shuppie, I think BK was good without being great this year. I am glad we've re-signed him. I know that that was kind of in the air because he did leave Manly under Des in the past. I'll give BK a 7 out of 10. He didn't stand out too often positively or negatively. He was just doing his job this year. Um, so I'll go 7 out of 10 for BK. What rating are you going to give him? I'm going to agree. I'm going to say bang on 7 out of 10. I think that he did have a couple of standout games here and there where it really did turn it up. But he did also have a lot of those moments, like you said, where he just didn't really, didn't really get to see a great deal of him in this electric back line. But with that being said, like BK hasn't done anything wrong this season. I think that he deserved his contract extension. Uh, as you said, Desi came in. Desi, I believe, was the one who got rid of him at Manly. But also, I believe he brought him in at Manly. So, you know, it's a real good positive that we are sticking with BK. I think that he definitely is a quality player among this team. I think 7 out of 10 did what he needed to do this year. Wasn't anything, you know, spectacular but did everything that he needed to do this year. And the strength of BK's game this year was his offloads, I think. You know, there was games against like the Raiders and Dolphins where he had 5 in both games um, close to 20 metres. Unfortunately we did lose both games but he was definitely providing that X factor out wide for us. Let's go to Jaden Campbell. A mixed season for Jaden where every time he was on he was close to our best. But at stages, he had limited opportunities, which was not his fault. Defensively, for me, still an issue with his size, which is why I do prefer him at fullback, where there's less, less chance you can be targeted by large back rowers. But he's the one player in our side, in my opinion, that can create for himself and others at any moment's notice. He's got that freaky X factor like Cameron Munster, where he can just make it happen. So although limited opportunities by no fault of his own, JC for me, Eight out of 10. What are you going to give JC? JC was one of our most electric players this year. It was very simply one of our best guys to watch when he had the ball. He was exciting. He obviously had the talent. It really was brilliant. I loved everything about what JC would do when he was on the field. But again, it came down to the fact that he was in and out of the team. You know, Justin didn't know whether he wanted to have him as fullback or have him as 14. And when he was on the bench, did he get as many minutes as he probably should have? I uh, remember a game that he didn't come on to the last seven minutes of the game. And I think that maybe was the Dolphins, actually, uh, which the 
game we don't speak about. But look, I think that JC had a very good year. I think it was a, a, a career-defining year that really established himself as a player that we do need for this club and is that X Factor. And there was a moment in the year where he didn't necessarily know how he was fitting into the team, like what's his what's his place in this team, and I think he found it. So, yeah, I'm happy to go with an 8 out of 10 for, for JC. I think he had a great year to really establish himself. Yeah, I was really unhappy with how he was used in some games this year. Like you said, the Dolphins game, 8 minutes. The Raiders one that we were both at, 5 minutes. Uh, really, really strange, because particularly towards the end of the year, when he was either at fullback or five, he's shown us he is a genuine starter in the NRL. Uh, I'll let you start for this next one as well, as to not hold the time. JoJo for feeder. What are you going to give JoJo? Jojo had a bit of a tough year, man. You know, he had a bit of an injury. He actually had quite a bit of a lingering injury at points, which uh, for him really messed up his season quite a bit. I was expecting a lot more from Jojo. I know Jojo well. He's a great bloke. I do think that this year wasn't his best year. I think that he has a lot more to give. We know what he can provide. Uh, wasn't able to get as much consistency this year as we've seen in the past when he had that that miniature breakout last year. He was trying to really establish himself. So I'm going to go along the same lines of Aaron Schwab here and say I'd give him a six, but I do know that he can absolutely have a better year than he's had this year, and he's just going to be chomping at the bit to really prove that. Yeah, for Jojo, he was backing up from his rookie season this year. We saw him eight times, and I believe it was either the year before or last year we saw him in the Australian Prime Minister side. This year we saw him 14 times, a combination of on the centre and the wing. And I actually think I prefer him on the wing based on what I've seen. He did tackle at 87.5% efficiency, which is really good given the positional changes. Um, he's still 20. He's still learning. The X factor is still there. I'm going to give him a 7 out of 10. I think he had some really good moments this year. Now, I know you're a big fan of this next book, so I will let you go first again. What about uh, the grand final bound Keanu Kinney? We all love a bit of Keanu Kinney in our lives. Look, he had a real you know, trial by fire this year. He had to take on teams like the Rabbitohs, like the Warriors, like the Panthers, like the Storm. You know, he had these big time teams that he really had to contend with as his introduction to the NRL. It's not like he did have that game against the Bulldogs, but he had an introduction by absolute fireman. And obviously it was really his debutant year. I think that he did have his moments where he struggled to really find himself and get himself in games. However, with him being a rookie and with the trial by fire, I know what kind of talent he can possess, but this isn't re reviewing what talent you can possess. It is how your season went. And I think I would just go with a, a straight up seven here. I don't think that we can be too harsh on him. I think, again, he is a rookie and it does come down to who he played. I do think there are big things to come for him, but I think it's just a, a pretty simple seven at this point. I like Keanu Kenny on and off the field. I saw a YouTube video where he went over his sneakers collection, actually, which is quite interesting, hearing him speak, getting to know him a little bit more. Uh, six games... As, uh, just Kenny's just quickly, on in regards to that, as soon as he put that up on his Instagram, this was actually a couple of hours ago, I messaged him my shoe size, and I, think, I said, thanks, bro. <laughs> no, well, apparently he wants to create his own uh, shoe brands. I was like, I just messaged my shoe, shoe okay. size, and I was like, thanks, bro. <laughs> yeah. That was a bit of a joke well, there. So, you know, maybe, maybe he'll, be, uh, he'll be able to sponsor the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, when he does create it, we'll definitely... Uh, we'll definitely give him a big shout out there. Uh, only six games for Kenny this year, but every time he started at fullback, got an opportunity off the bench, whatever it might have been, he only played the 80 minutes twice. Uh, there was a Sharks game where he shifted there at, at half time and played out the whole second half. I like what I see, and I want to see more. He never let us down this year with every chance he got. I never once thought after seeing Kenny on the field, well, he looks a bit a little bit raw for a rookie. I was really excited with those. So, so I'm going to go seven and a half out of 10. I'm a big Kenny fan. Camamalo, I've got not applicable for a rating. Zero games this year. I did have a good year with the Bears. 15 games for 12 tries and assists there and 154 metres gained. But um, do you agree we won't give a rating to players we didn't see feature at NRL level? Yeah, we can't give a, a, a rating to Kenny Mamalo. Like he, look, he did really good stuff for, for the Burley Bears. Uh, wasn't anything you know out of this world, but absolutely is in the equation to to be a part of this this wing setup. So look, yeah, NA for this year. But look, hopefully, you know, I think he is signed for another couple of years as it is. Yeah, Kenny Mamalo is there for the next few years. Let's go Kieran Foran now. I don't think there's too much more Kieran could have done this year. He was clearly compromised by injury and fought on and realistically, like let me be very clear with this, gave his future health for our club. Like this is a guy that after round 10 could have pulled the pin on the season and thought, nah, I'm on a pretty good contract here. I need toe surgery. 
and he fought on, which is clearly going to affect him with his children and family in the future moving forward. So I love what Kieran did for our club this year, effort-wise. I can't forget what he gave for us. I'm going to go a nine and a half out of ten. Yeah, I love what you're saying. Yeah, I, I think that everything you said there was is brilliant, especially considering after every game I see Fozza and he is limping. You know, he is really putting his everything into this team. You know, as you said, he could have easily packed it up and said, you know what, pack it in. It's time for get surgery and I'm going to chill out, earn some money and, you know, be on the sidelines or support the boys on the sidelines. But he didn't. You know, that's not Kieran Foran's work ethic. This man's work ethic is honestly unbelievable. I love what this guy has provided this club. Happy to give him a straight up nine, a cold hard nine. Obviously, there are still things that, you know, we do want to see there. But with that being said, I think he does everything that he possibly can. Um, You know, it's just obviously when you get to that 10 marker, you're looking at it has a perfect and overall it's really hard to give anybody from the team this year a pure 10 or really really damn well close to that in like a nine and a half in my personal opinion just because there is still a lot to be wanted and I think that does come down to as well the injuries that Fozza has had this year but again that does come down to the fact that he is just putting his body on the line so I'm gonna give him a stone cold nine absolutely love what he did he's a great bloke he loves this club he loves everything he's doing and uh, really excited to see what he can do under Desi next year oh with his uh, with with the master and the apprentice back next year, we can only expect foreign to improve, which is amazing for our club. Let's go to Philip Sami now. Before I get to this, I will say I've spoken to Phil with this. He's okay with me saying this, but I'll get to that in a second. Twenty one games this year, one hundred and fourteen tackle breaks and one hundred and seventy one meters averaged. Genuine rep player statistics, right there for a spot in the Queensland Maroons would not have looked out of place, but. Last Sunday or last Saturday, rather, at the Star Casino in Sydney. He told me he was coming. He wanted to watch the Roosters and Sharks. He didn't come. He didn't come. So whilst it wasn't... One out of 10. 10. One out of 10. That's it. One out of 10. Yeah. Whilst it was a 9 out of 10, it has actually been downgraded to a 1 out of 10 for his poor off-field attitude, where he absolutely (laughs) dogged me. And uh, look, I wasn't happy. I was excited to watch the game with him him and JC. But Phil, one out of ten. Unbelievable, out of 10. Phil. You know what, what you Phil? Get, Phil? Have a word to yourself, Phil. <laughs> have, have a word to yourself. Dog and the boys. How dare you? I, I I thought better of you, man. But you know, it wasn't me though. So you know, you can have your your qualms with Clark uh, with Clark over here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to give you a nine out of ten because I thought you had an absolutely fantastic season. I thought you were strong. I thought that Phil. I, maybe I'm going to stop speaking to him directly now. Uh, but <laughs> I thought Phil was strong. I thought he he scored tries. I thought that he had a massive massive bounce back bounce back year after a couple of years where he was kind of like getting by and doing what he needed to do at a good level. But this year, he really took it up another level to get him back into the origin frame. Obviously, I believe he's Samoa representative, uh, 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 applicable as well. Uh, I loved what Phil Sartley brought to the team this year. Very, very good player. Very, very strong winger. Uh, I don't think we missed Greg Martsu, uh as much as we could have if it wasn't for Sammy really standing up and with Loffy standing up as well. So I'm going to give uh, Phil Sami a, a 9 out of 10. I thought he was great across the season, except for the fact he dogged the boys. Yeah, obviously we cannot brush over that fact. We'd love to ignore it, but it goes down to a 1 out of 10, baby. Sorry, Phil. Uh, let's go to a man who has a 100% conversion accuracy this year. One of your favorite players. I'll let you go first for the man, the myth, the legend, Tanner Boyd. Mate, he doesn't miss. It's not possible for him to miss. It's not possible. If it's coming down to his uh, conversion kicking, I'm giving him a straight up 10 out of 10. Like that is just, it's beautiful. It's a sight to behold. You know, he just does not simply miss. In regards to his game this year, I do think there is still a lot for us to, for, to be seen from Tanner Boyd. Obviously, he did everything that he was asked of this year in a struggling team. Definitely has a lot to work on in regards to his defense defensive abilities, but he was also still pretty good at defense. It's just that, you know, there is still a lot of his game that needs to be worked on. Um, Attacking-wise, I think he has improved as a player, and I think as the season went on, we really started to see that Tanner Boyd can be a really, really quality player. The seven is always picked apart at the Gold Coast Titans, and look, to be honest with you, it's always picked apart everywhere, unless you are a Nathan Cleary kind of guy, or a Daly Cherry Evans. And In Cherry Evans... Yeah, and even even those guys can be p- be picked out, right? So, look, I'm going to say with Tan, I'm going to give him a straight I'm going to give him a 7. Um, but I also think that a 7.5 could be viable as well based on the improvements that we did see throughout the season. Yeah, I've got 8 and 8 out of 10 here for Boyd. I think I'm going to tone that back to 7.5. 21 games this year, average 435 kick meters 
and converted at 80% according to the NRO website. But I do believe that's a conspiracy and it was more so at 100%. Um, did tackle at 85% efficiency. Look, I'm really proud of Tanner this year. You know, I will go 8, eight out of 10. I'm really proud of how he came in, took over a jersey from Toby Sexton that was like genuinely the hardest seven jersey to take over in the NRL um, just because it was a jersey that we didn't have too much success with the previous year. And people were looking at our roster and saying, yes, it's improved. But outside haven't of Titans fans... haven't had much fans, success since Scotty Prince in the seven, man. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a long time before for, before drinks, realistically. And, you know, I was so proud of Tanner because if, if I told you at the start of this year, and I'm talking a wider NRL audience here, that Tanner Boyd is going to have a great seven and play it the whole year at halfback for the Titans, people would have genuinely disagreed and, and thought that, he, you know, he'd be in and out of the side. But he didn't. He was there all season. So I'm really, really proud of Tanner. And I'm so excited for his future with our club. Our next player is Tommy Weaver. Now, I've got him in the same boat as Kinney, where we saw three games, limited opportunity. I thought at times he probably pushed a pass or a kick that he shouldn't have. But look, that's me being extremely picky. And when you're a rookie halfback in the NRL, it's the toughest job in the entire game. So I was really impressed outside of those small areas, what we saw from Tommy. Never looked too overawed. Give every opportunity at a red hot crack. So I'm going to go a seven and a half out of 10, out of 10 rather for Tom. What are you going to give Tommy Boy? I love that. I'm actually going to give him an eight out of 10. I thought that he, yeah. w- with his very limited game time, with his very limited amount of time, he did get given another similar treatment to uh, Keanu Kenny, where he came up against some really tough, damn well teams. And we also saw what kind of warrior this man is against the dogs, where he got the boot to the face. He had like broken everything on his face, but yet he still cracked on. And, you know, Tommy Weaver is just. He's got a work ethic, very similar to Tanner Boyd in this regard, that they will absolutely dig deep for this team. And look, I think, yeah, in the limited time frame, yes, he did push it past too many sometimes, but that is due to the fact that he's a debutant, a rookie. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I really liked him this season. So in the limited time frame, I'll give him a 8 out of 10. Yeah, and I think like everyone listening right now loves the Titans so much. And we all acknowledge like this, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm grabbing a Titans logo right now. This logo means so much. And when you see someone in their third NRL game as a young 20-year-old, cop such a nasty you know knock to the head and literally give their blood sweat and tears at times for this jersey man i can only respect that so much and if i'm ever on the gold coast tommy and we're having a few beers mate you will not be paying for one all night i love what you did there in that game in particular you <laughs> did will you, not be uh, did you meet him at the members night down there in melbourne I did. I got a photo with him and Tino with my daughter. He was he was really cool. Uh, look super at you, nice, little fanboy. Eh? Look, look at nah, you, mate, little fanboy. I, <laughs> I am the biggest fanboy for Titans. Every time I meet a Titans player, I still get the shakes that I used to get. Um, I'll never forget the first Titans player I got something signed of. It was Luke Bailey. Um, and everyone was, you know what it's like after a game when members are on the field. He was oh, there. And it, yep. <laughs> everyone was going at him and I was really shy. And I had the 2014 NRL Elite Masters card. And, I, and uh, he was the master that year. Ryan James was the apprentice for that series. And I remember just shaking, Luke, can I please get a signature? Um, since that moment, you know, I'd go around the bus after. I, I meet other players from other teams in the NRL. I'm just like, g'day, mate, how are you? And, you know, I, I like your stuff, Clarkie, or you're a wanker, Clarkie. I'm kidding. No one's ever said No <laughs> players have said that yet. Um, oh, you know, I've said it. I, I've personally yeah, said you, it. I know but... you have. <laughs> yeah. I know, you, well, next time I see your phone, Instagram logins, there's probably 100 burn accounts are there. They're the ones that hate me. <laughs> no, I'm only messing. Uh, but no, seriously, anytime I meet a player from another club, completely normal conversation. Anytime I meet a Titans player, man, I'm breathing. I'm thinking about the conversation. Um, Because it just takes me back to that boy that just loves this club so much. And I I love that feeling, to be honest. Our final two players, uh, Tony Francis and Tremaine Spry. Uh, We won't give them ratings. A few words on them for me. Unreal year for Francis with the Bears in the prelim final here, about to go, sorry, in the grand final here, about to go to hope for this state championship as well. We hope for a debut in round 27. Instead, we saw Shoppy move to the wing. He's still 20 years old. All I can say for Francis is the talent's there. Get back to work. We're all behind you at the times. We want to see your debut. We want to see you at this club, mate. Keep working, and the debut will be very, very soon. And Tremaine Spry, again, a player who didn't feature this year but has in previous years, shifted between centre and fullback for Tweed this year and proved that he provides us good depth there on the outside backs where possible. Uh, But, again, no rating from me for either player. A chance for you to give a word on both. 
Yeah, look, no rating, to be fair. Like, I would have loved to have seen Tony in that last game against the Doggies, but it wasn't to be. Shop, he went out to the wing and did what he needed to do there. Uh, yeah, look, they've both got some great talent there. Obviously, Tony for Burley and Tremaine for the Tweedhead Seagulls. Unlucky for Tremaine that he won't be able to perform in the grand final, but Tony Francis still has that grand final to look forward to to really show out. So, look, I don't know uh, contract-wise how it's going for those two, but, um, you know, they're definitely good talents that we could see in, in the future. And I think for Tremaine, I'm not sure if this was his first season back or was it his second back, but he did come back from a, a pretty unexpected and traumatic injury, which is a really, really great effort to get back to professional rugby league and something as Titans fans we can only uh, appreciate and applaud. Now, we're going to jump into our Q&A section, but we're going to run it a little bit differently moving forward now. What we found when we went out to you guys uh, was a lot of the same questions week to week, and if not the same, similar. And it didn't really allow us to narrow in on any uh, topics that we hadn't really previously discussed on the podcast in that episode. So how we're going to run it now, me and Blaze are going to put out a call or a question every single week, and we're going to post it to all Titans fan groups and pages everywhere to capture the widest possible response for discussion. Now, what our call is this week, it comes from Blaze, and he says, serious question, what is the reasoning behind not getting behind our women's team this year or just simply in general? To clarify, there's nothing wrong, and I'm not having a go at anyone for choosing not to support the NRLW as they do the NRL. Just genuinely curious as to the possible reasons it doesn't garner anywhere near as much support. Is it that you don't like the women's game as much? You're invested in it due to being the brand new side venture? Maybe you're clicking off Rugby League now and getting back into watching the Premier Premier League, NFL, NBA, NHL, etc. No answer is wrong. It's your decision and time but I think it would be beneficial to the club to see some answers here so that they can try and push promotion to adjust based off our fan responses. Make perfect way to kick off this segment. Great question. The NRLW is something that on this podcast, we really want to push and promote and give our girls the best possible support. How did the fans or the the followers of the Titans respond to this uh, question? Oh man, we were absolutely flooded with responses here. We had a whole heap on Instagram that I posted up. We had a whole heap on on the Facebook groups, whether it be the, our Gold Coast Titans Frontline Podcast Facebook group that you guys should join so you can get amongst it as well. Uh, obviously the fan club and, and Frontline and, and also the Instagram. So, you know, there were some really, really good responses here that I think that it's great to discuss to kind of get a read for what's going on right now in regards to the NRLW because we do, for me, again, have the best NRLW support and that, you know, question there wasn't to go at anybody. It was just to kind of gauge what people's thoughts were and and why maybe we aren't getting as many followers to a team that is winning right now. And I, I do think that there is a, a vast amount of reasons. But, you know, a couple of the responses that we did get, we got one from the Zach Gridley who said, I got into the Titans for the players and what they represented. The girls don't have that yet. What would you say to that, Dane? Do you think that the... Uh, do, do you agree with that, that the Titans men's team have, you know, shown representation for the community whilst the women's haven't yet? What would you say to that? I think both have equally shown their love to the community, but I do see the point in that, that the men and not even our current roster, the ones that have come before have built what this logo is and what it represents. And the women don't have a a sole identity right now. Not that I necessarily think they have to. Um, So yeah, I agree in part with that, but also disagree that they need to have their own identity Just some context before you go back to another comment. Our men's side averages 16,585 crowds this year. Our women's is about 1,900. So that's, you know, adds the context as to why we're asking the question, I suppose. I've got 14,000 people showing up for the men's, but not the women's at this stage. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. I think that the women uh, as players and the, the people, that, the players that are playing, I think that they are definitely trying to immerse themselves in the community. I see them all the time. They were going around signing and, and getting amongst the, the people of the game on Sunday. So I definitely think they're, they're doing their best. Obviously, we are a brand new team. We've only been around, what, two, three years now. And we are really trying to acclimatize ourselves to the situation. So look, I understand they haven't been able to really grasp that identity yet. But I think that there also could be a stigma issue as well in regards to the NRLW that a lot of people do struggle to get into the women's game based on the fact that, you know, we do have that five, six years ago where the quality was just really average. It was four teams. It was just the Warriors, the Broncos, the Dragons, and the... 
uh, Roosters. I think they were the four teams there. And the quality just wasn't great because it was the first time, but now we're really starting to grow it. So I think that, look, we can really remove that stigma now and we can really start to push forward. Shannon Wilkinson here has said, I'd really like to see some sort of discounted bundle for the two memberships. Not sure if there is already something like that, but I'd definitely consider it for next season. I don't value the NRLW any less. I think the girls put on an extremely entertaining game every time. It would just be a cost thing, at least for me and my family. What would you say to that, Dane? I think the idea of a shared membership is a really good idea. Um, you know, it could be something that the club considers where, look, short term, we know we're not going to make ticket sales in the NRLW, uh, but we offer it as a package with our NRL, and hopefully that gets people wanting to come back and come for more. And that has worked for other successful businesses in the past. You know, I think of Uber most notably. It used to be so cheap to get an Uber. Now it's essentially the same as a taxi, but because they've built up that reputation that you know they're reliable and a good service, maybe the same could apply with our women's side where at first we take the hit, but eventually we do start to charge again. And I think people start to love the product and they understand why and are happy to charge. My one I want to go to, and I'm, I'm, if I say anyone's name, I'm not having a shot at you at all. Um, it, it, I, we just want to discuss it. And it comes from Nathan Davey. And he actually said, I think it's boring, no real big hits and nothing exciting. And I do see a lot of blokes in particular have that sort of mindset around the NRLW. And I think it's kind of, as a dude, there's a stigma that women's sport is it can't be as good as men. And, and men's sport is the only sport that I'll watch. And I, I just I just don't understand. It's a very old school mentality where particularly, like we both have daughters, right? So we understand the future uh, that we want to provide for our daughters and, and what these women are putting in every single week and what they have in the past that these opportunities exist for all athletes, regardless of gender. And for Nathan, I was going to say this, but I can see you've said, uh, you've actually replied and said, every hit Riley Jorgensen makes, <laughs> I feel my soul, bro. And I agree. I was actually going to say, Nathan, if you're ever on the Gold Coast, genuinely, I will send you $200 to your bank account if you run it straight at Riley. And you tell me that there was no big hit there. And I, I guess I'll have to pay Riley as well. So I'm going to go broke for this challenge. So I reckon she'd be down for that, man. I reckon she'd be down. I know Riley, she was in the front line actually last week at the Bulldogs mm. game. I reckon she'd be down for that, man, if we could set that up. So... You know, maybe we uh, <laughs> maybe we try and set it up there. That's quite funny. But look, yeah, you're you're 100 right, man. You know, you look at some of these tacklers, like run it straight, Jessica Elliston, run it straight, Shannon Mato. You know, Riley Jorgensen. You know, Shaley Bent knows how to get a motor chugging as well. Georgia Hale, like oh, hello, no, thank you. I'm all good with Georgia Hale running at me, or you know, just try and tackle me because she's going to absolutely slap me. And I'm a big bopper. I'm a big guy too. So yeah, look, I think that there is a, a real as you said, stigma around that the, the women's game can't be as good as the men's. And I can see that with other sports, but that's not that's just due to the way the sport comes across. You actually watch the NRLW. We are one of the best women's sports in the world. I will 100% say that because I watch all different kinds of sports. You know, I watch women's football. It's great. And I think that's probably the most comparable on like a team sport. Like you could look at tennis, which is phenomenal. But like the AFLW hasn't captured it. The AFLW just doesn't have that same quality like I do believe the NRLW does have. And I just think that we need to really, you know, clutch onto that and really grab onto that and absolutely smash it. So look, I think that people just need to, yeah, forget about the, the past in that regards and just kind of um, really... I think, I don't know if he's actually had a, a watch of a game. I would, I'll be honest with you. Like some people, they might say they have, but they might have watched one game or two. If you actually give it a bit of time and you watch a couple of games, you will see that there is quality. It is still building. We're not saying it's the perfect. It's, we're not saying it's the NRL caliber just yet. But the NRL has been going around. Rugby league, professional rugby league, has been going around in the men's game since 1908. That's 115 mm -hmm. years ago, right? The women's game has been going for around for six, seven years. And there was a break in between. So... You know, we really need to adjust our mindsets and understand that the women's game is really quality to watch. Maybe not at the men's level, but it definitely is quality. Now, another one here that I think we'll, we'll have as our last, because we have been going on for a little bit of time now, unless you might have one important one afterwards, is from Liam Hatch. And he says, make it 17 teams and do double headers at every ground. Like the old reserve grade days, and we'll, it will catch up to the men's game. Doubles the content for broadcasters, fan bases will grow, and so will memberships. In Australia, unfortunately, women's sport will never overtake the male game. Look at our cricket team. Girls are arguably the best sporting team on the planet and very little airtime compared to the men. If they sold double the content instead of splitting the comp, the revenue stream would be larger. Now, just before I go to you for your response to that, I think that, look, in a very ideal world, like the most ideal world possible, that is a brilliant idea. And I think that we would all love to see a 
you know, it's like a reserve grade comp in the men's. We we have wanted that for a long time to be the the pre game curse of the men's game. But if we had the women's and we had seventeen teams, bingo. Let's have the women's games go of the exact same. You know, um, traveling and and whatnot, the same time schedule as the men's. But that just doesn't work right now because we've only got a, a few teams in the competition. What is it? Eight teams now. We have got the Titans, the Going Broncos, to ten in the future. Yeah, 10 in the future, right? But we got the Titans, the Broncos, the Cowboys, the Knights, the Dragons, the Sharks, the Tigers, the Eels, the Roosters, and the... Uh, the Raiders? Raiders, there we go. So we've got 10 teams. So you're looking right now at nine games throughout the season. You have to then triple that. We have to triple that to then get to the 27-game season of a men's comp. And it's just not really going to be viable in that sense. It really isn't because we don't have the funding for it. Now, I know people are going to say, oh, well, to get the funding, we need to have the, you know, we need it to be a watchable and what, that type of stuff. But for me, in an ideal world, that works. But I just don't think that we're ready for anything of that kind of level yet. But if we get to that point, it would be a brilliant idea. What would you say to that, Clarky? I'll get to that in one second. I agree. And I definitely take your word on women's sport when you say that the NRLW is at a higher standard than some. I remember we were watching the Women's FIFA World Cup at the at Northeast before the Sharks game. And it, the tournament was just underway. And you said to me, the two best sides is Spain and England. They ended up playing in, in the final. So you definitely know a thing or two there. And I do agree with Liam Hatch. But we have to be realistic, and the, the facts are at the moment the NRLW does run at a loss that is uh, covered by the NRL. So the NRL men are, in some ways, uh, the, the revenue profits they're making is being deducted by the NRL at this stage. So I think if you go to 17 teams, not only would it be too quick to exp- expand and the, the players simply aren't available, um, I don't think it worked just yet, but I do agree in the future that is absolutely the the way to do it the only part i disagree with is when he says like the old reserve grade days um i actually think there should be games where the women sometimes they're after sometimes they're before i've got no issue either way um, and i don't think fans will once we get more and more my final one is actually from ben southam if it's the right fella he went to the same high school as me and was four years under me i'm in the same grade as his brother luke southam who now works for the cowboys but ben says everything takes time to build a strong fan base look at musicians businesses for example but it is exciting to see that they are proving to be dedicated, strong contenders, which is already starting to convince me more and more Titans fans, and not just fans, but sponsors too, will help fund grassroots and expansion they deserve. I love it. I feel like I have two teams to support under the same flag. I think we're building something great. Proud to be a fan. I love that from Ben. I absolutely agree. And I just wonder if we do win the premiership this year, you know, the Knights this year, their NRLW average crowd is listed at 8,000 which would be one of the highest for McDonald Jones. The Knights won the premiership last year. I think the year before that, it wouldn't have been 8,000. So I do wonder if we do go on all the way this year or or make the grand final even, how much do we grow? How much do those supporters that are on the fence or might only watch it if there's nothing else on become hardcore fans like they are for our NRL side? Love that take by Ben. Absolutely agree with it. And particularly love the part where he says, I love it. I feel like I have two teams to support. And that's exactly how I felt for most of this year since the NRLW started. It's a great feeling, isn't it? Yeah, uh, and, and like I said at the beginning of the podcast, you know, we've got a team right now to to follow. You know, we have the, the women's team for uh, the point that the men's aren't in the finals right now. So although our team might not be going well there, well, guess what? Now you can get on the, the other wagon. It's not really getting on a wagon because you're a Titans fan as it is, but now you've got the women's team that you can really fall on get behind as well to really push some support behind them. And I do think that we are growing. I think that there is still a long way to go. You know, it's not like you can just start up a venture and it's just massively successful immediately. You you do have to work at it. You've got to put time into it. And I think that's what we are doing right now. I, I, I'm not insulting our fan base at all because I think that we do actually have the, the best real overall community for the NRLW. I think a lot of those night statistics probably do come down to the fact that they were double headers though with the Knights double team. Headers, yeah, because yeah. Yeah, I remember that's that a lot of those fun. games... I remember a lot of those games were were double headers before the, the men's game. But with that being said, I'm not trying to detract from that. Overall, we are growing. And I'm really glad that there is a, a, a love for the game. So a lot of people, you know, talking here, there is a lot of people really backing in saying, you know what, Some, I'm not, I'm not, might not just be able to go to it, but I'll watch it. And if I can go to it, I'll go to it. Or people are just across the country. Look, you're in Canberra, but you love every moment of it, and you'll get to them when they're in Canberra this week. So, yeah, okay. look, obviously we are um, we are building. It's exciting times. I think we're, we've got some great atmosphere at home. I would love, you know, it would be great 
home final next week. We win this week. Roosters lose this week. We get a home final. We get like, what, 5K to the game. That'll be absolutely monumental. We'll get a good atmosphere pumping and that will really start to build the foundations for a supporter base. And it will really bring out the guys on the Gold Coast and the women on the Gold Coast to get behind this team and say, you know what? I'm also a fan of just the Gold Coast as a community. That is what we are. We are not just the footy is the face of it. We're representing the community. We're from the Gold Coast. This is where our family lives. This is where we live. This is where we all are. We're, we're all from. So be proud of where you're from. The women's team is building, and let's get, keep cracking on. Mate, absolutely love it. We are extremely appreciative of our listeners and viewers' time. We realize we've been going a little bit longer than schedule, mostly due to my own babbling this week, guys, but I just had a lot to get off my chest. So I want to say thank you very much. If you're still here listening and viewing, we absolutely appreciate it. And uh, from myself, we hope to see you back next week too recap our Titans NRLW's performance and then fingers crossed we're previewing a finals game after that as well as continuing our in-part review of our NRL season so from myself thank you very much and I will see you next week and over to you Blaze to close the show yeah, look, I think we went a little bit longer this week because we also had the individual player analysis from uh, from all the, our back line. And we'll probably go a little bit longer next week with the forwards. But I guess you guys, you guys, if you're listening in, then that means that you're enjoying the content that we're putting out there for you. You know, we uh, we do have plans to bring on players and staff and whatnot in the future, which has been really cementing, as we said last week. We're really cementing uh, this podcast moment and giving you our analysis and our opinions and our thoughts. And, and then obviously we'll build from there. But yeah, look, we appreciate all your support as usual. We appreciate people getting out for the men's, for the women's for the Host Plus Cup teams and just really encapsulating the Gold Coast community because that's what we do it for. That's what everyone should be doing it for. And uh, I love the Gold Coast. It's just as simple as that. So if you're here on the YouTube, obviously hit that thumbs up button, comment below your thoughts. If you have a question for next week that we can then ask to the public and then get the the thought processes and whatnot then do obviously shoot them through. It'd be great to see. If you're on Spotify and Apple, you know, I think you can rate us. Give us a good rating there, uh, which obviously helps other Titans fans to listen in. Uh, But as per usual, we appreciate you, and uh, we'll see you after we slap the old Canberra Raiders. So no more, uh, no more Canberra Raiders coming to the finals. They're going to be fading, just like their men's team did. Slap them down. Shing! Shing! Premiership muscle. <laughs>